Hello, I'm Phil Ponce, host of WTTW's public affairs program, Chicago Tonight. For well over 30 years, Dr. John McLaughlin was an important part of the public television landscape. His passing on Tuesday was a great loss. The McLaughlin Group was an iconic program that was watched each week by millions of public television viewers across the country. The animated and thoughtful discussions Dr. McLaughlin moderated kept audiences engaged and interested in the important issues that impacted Washington and the world. As a tribute to the remarkable longevity of this groundbreaking program, today we will take a look back at a special edition of the McLaughlin Group that was taped in Chicago during the very early days of the series back in 1983. WTTW, Chicago's PBS station, was proud to be the presenting station of this program and everyone associated with the McLaughlin Group will always be appreciative of the remarkable support and loyalty you, the viewer, gave Dr. McLaughlin and the McLaughlin Group over the years. Thank you for watching. First Chicago Center. This is a special edition of the McLaughlin Group in Chicago. Now here is the publisher of the Chicago Sun-Times, James Ho. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the McLaughlin Group Public Affairs Show, sponsored tonight by the Chicago Sun-Times. I am James Hogue, publisher of the Sun-Times, and on my left is the McLaughlin Group, a weekly television panel of five of America's most popular and respected columnists. They candidly discuss, and you will here shortly, often debate the major issues of the day. The good guys and the bad guys, depending on one's political bent, include John McLaughlin, the producer moderator, and the Washington executive editor of the National Review. Robert Novak, co-author of the political column Inside Report, which appears in more than 200 newspapers, including the Chicago Sun-Times. Morton Kondracki, executive editor of the New Republic, and also a columnist appearing in the Sun-Times. Jack Germond, co-author of the syndicated column, Politics Today, and Patrick Buchanan, syndicated columnist and radio talk show host. Tonight's half-hour discussion at the First Chicago Center will be followed by questions from our audience. I'm sure you soon will understand why this stimulating, provocative group has become one of the best-watched public affairs shows on television. Dr. McLaughlin. Number one, what, what about all the talk about a woman veep uh, on the Democratic side? You had this kowtowing, and maybe what that's too strong a word, Jack, for your yeah. friends on the Democratic Party, but the kowtowing of the six-pack, the seven-pack, actually McGovern was in there too, uh, saying that he probably will uh, think seriously about selecting a woman as yeah. a vice presidential candidate. Is this, this going to help or hurt? It's, they're making a terrible mistake. They're getting the, uh, the feminist hopes up, and there's no way they can pick a woman, because to do so, they'd have to pass over the U.S. Senate, the governor's conference, their party chairman, and their house leadership, and they're not going to oh, do that. That, that. that is absolute garbage. Why in the world shouldn't they talk about that? The fact of the matter is it's not likely because no woman is in that position in the Democratic Party right now. So there are a couple, but the idea, the idea they have to deal with those groups, Pat, stick in your own party, believe me. What yeah, about and, and, you know, and furthermore, and furthermore, what's happening is, is that the, the American people are gradually being prepared from the, for the day when yeah, we're going to have true. a woman vice president. And you know something? It'll probably be in the Republican of Party. Of course it will. The first correct thing you've said tonight, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you exactly when it's going to happen. It's going to... It's wait a minute, wait just a minute. Let, let me finish. Watch this. When? It's, uh, it's going to happen when the Republican Party comes into an election that they think they're way behind in, and mm -hmm. they are desperate. It almost happened. Happened in 1976. It almost happened in 1976 when the Ford people seriously considered Ann Armstrong. They lost their nerve, or they would have won the election. A week happened. from Sunday, a new a. A uh, film will premiere in Washington, D.C. called The Right Stuff. Do any of you have any feeling as to what impact this will have on John Glenn's candidacy? I think it'll be elevated. Jack Jamon. Uh, who goes to movies? <coughs> I don't know. I go to movies. I think the impact's been overrated. <laughs> Marginal oh, plus surprise. for him? No, everybody knows John Glenn is an astronaut, I think. Yeah, I, you know, it's going to give him a blip for a week. You agree I mean, with that, uh, Bob? It'll have about as much effect as the NEA, AFA, LCIO <laughs> main endorsement Jesse from Jackson. Mondale. What impact will Jesse Jackson's candidacy, if he announces, have on the Mondale candidacy? Jack Jamon. 
Uh, if, if Jesse Jackson runs for president, it's going to change the whole, it's going to change all the equations of the Democratic Party. It's going to change the Southern, uh, Southern primaries particularly. Uh, uh, Mondale's got a lot of trouble. That, that might very well be the last blow he could take. And let, let me add something to that. In, in Washington, everybody says, will Jesse run or will he, will he not run? Maybe, maybe not. I don't find any politician that I've talked to in Chicago has any doubt. Of course, Chicago, all, Chicago politicians are notoriously right about everything. Right, that's right. But they, John, they, they know Jesse, and they all are confident he'll run. If John Anderson runs as an independent third-party candidate, what will the impact be on the general election in November of 84? I think it'll, it'll be less than, less than a lot of people think. Very, I, I just don't think. I think John Anderson has been around the, yeah. the track once, and heading around the track again, he's not going to have uh, John, for every 10 votes John Anderson gets, nine will come out of the Democratic Party. Is Ronald Party. Reagan running for president? Pat yeah. Buchanan. Yes, sure. Bob Novak. I'm almost positive. Let me, let me interject this at this point. There's a story floating around Washington and around the country, for that matter, that Nancy Reagan, because her weight dropped from 114 pounds to 104 pounds or less, that uh, she's unwell. And this will affect Ronald Reagan's decision whether he will run or not run. Can any of you speak to this on the basis of rumor assessment? Well, this is something that uh, a lot of people are talking about that nobody, know, nobody knows very much about. But I was talking to a person who claims to be close to Mrs. Uh, Reagan, and she said that it is, there is no truth that she is in bad health, there is no truth that she is urging her, pre her husband not to run. But having said all that, if there is only one reason in the world why he might not run, the only reason, it would be if Mrs. Yeah. Reagan asked as him not part to of this, As part of this debunking of the rumor, one hears, Was I debunking it? Oh. Uh, one oh. hears the following information. Number one, she's sick with a cold. Number two, she just lost her, her dear uh, father. Number three, her mother is unable to talk with her on the telephone on a regular basis, daily basis, as had been the case because of her, of her age, and a variety of other reasons that do, it seems to me, satisfactorily account for the fact that she's not a sick, a, a sick woman at all. Furthermore, her weight ought to be around 102 pounds. You want to add to that? <laughs> you want to add to that, Jack, as an authority on the subject? All I want to tell you is when I lose 10 pounds, nobody notices. <laughs> All right, killer question. Ready? Assuming John Anderson does mount an independent candidacy, assuming that the Republican slate is Ronald Reagan and George Bush, and assuming that on the Democratic side you have Walter Mondale set with any of the following uh, Hart. Uh, Hollings, Askew, Glenn, uh, Benson, Benson, Mark White of Texas, Dale Bumpers. With a time lapse, uh, TV, time lapse TV wise, it's now November the 9th, 1984, Wednesday, the day after the election. Who has won the election? Pat Buchanan. Reagan Bush over Mondale Glenn. Reagan. Jack. I'd have been, no, I'd better read. Um, depends on the economy. Oh, oh. Come on, oh. Mort. These liberals do not want to give you a straight answer. Mon Mondale. 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 Mondale over Reagan? Would you bet your ranch on that? I don't have, have a ranch. ranch. Fortunately, I, I don't have a <laughs> oh. Wow. Wow. Well, it's uh, clear. The answer is more. I'm sorry to inform you, but the, uh, the the winner of the 1984 race is Reagan Bush. That ticket. Now we'll uh, we'll go right into predictions and then conclude. Pat Buchanan, predictions. I think Argentina is going to be in a state of collapse by the end of the year, John, and the the banks are going to start writing down their bad loans. Government collapse. Oh, near Economy. anarchy. Near economic anarchy? economic collapse. We got an election on the thirtieth. Bob, administration is going to resume a battle that Mort had thought they had abandoned: the battle of the budget. They are going to make an assault on the budget by resurrecting that old favorite of Dwight D. Eisenhower's, the, the item, item veto. veto. Jack, they, uh, they've already done that. <laughs> no, they haven't. That's no the, prediction. Uh, the, the, the Democratic they haven't. It was in the paper. They haven't. It's a good prediction, Bob. It was in the paper. Because of the rule requiring that, that <laughs> Bob, stick by it. <laughs> because of the rule that robs presidential candidates of federal financing if they go under 10 percent in two primaries, Democratic field will be down to two after the New Hampshire primary. Mm. 
you're going to read a lot in the papers about uh, worries about terrorism at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. There's already a lot of fighting between the FBI and the Los Angeles Police Department over who's going to control security. And the danger is that we're going to, ha we're going to hear so much about terrorism in connection with the Olympics that it's going to give the wrong people the wrong kind of idea. Uh, my prediction is that within 26 days, i.e. before November 1, 1983, the interest rates will drop one half of one percentage point. I refer to the prime rate. And mortgage rates will follow in due course accordingly. Let's talk about Lebanon. The Congress says that the Marines can stay for a year and a half at Ronald Reagan's urging. Did Ronald Reagan do the, uh, choose the right course in keeping the Marines over there for a year and a half, Robert Novak? No, it's an <laughs> absolute disaster. There is, there, is no, there is no mission for them. There is nothing they can accomplish. They are a sitting duck there. It is one of the most feckless foreign policy decisions that I have seen by feckless this country. Feckless means cowardly. I think I heard about that. Uh, feckless doesn't mean It doesn't mean cowardly. Doesn't it does mean not cowardly. mean cowardly. <laughs> feckless means cowardly. No, no it doesn't. No. You want to make a bet? It means mistaken. I'm mistaken. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. I hate to be in this Second. position. I hate to be in the position of agreeing with Novak, but I do. You and the listening audience have now had the dubious pleasure of listening to the five uglies uh, do their number here, uh, and we'd like to entertain from you uh, your questions, your impressions. Perhaps you'd like to uh, put a question to us, uh, and or you might wish to add to what we've said, or you might wish to subtract from what we've said. I'd like to try a scenario on the panel. Tomorrow, Mr. Reagan calls in George Bush and says, George, you've been a great vice president, and in my second term, I need somebody else. He calls in the ambassador of the United Nations and says, you're it. You are my vice president. The question that I want to have you fellows answer is, is that, if that would happen, simply would it be a political plus or minus? Let me, try, let me start off on that. I, I would say, Mr. Roser, that it isn't going to happen. There's no chance of it happening. I want to get that in first, but I think it would be an absolute ten strike for President Reagan, and I think it would ensure his election. I you think it would be a, a political yes. coup on yes. his part to appoint Gene Kirkpatrick as his vice president? Yes. Oh, that, let me. I also agree it can't happen. One of Ronald Reagan's more endearing qualities, and I don't find that many, but one of them is that he is, he is a man who likes people who are around him a lot. George Bush has been around him a lot, and so he likes But he him. likes Gene, too. And I know he is. But if Gene Kirkpatrick became the vice presidential nominee, then we'd go back and start looking at all those crazy articles she wrote. Right, and... Uh, crazy look, in your opinion, uh, but uh, a very look, good look, sense. Ronald, and Ronald, Reagan, Ronald Reagan has said publicly that he wants mm -hmm. George Bush to be his running mate. He would only be kicking... Uh, George Bush off the ticket for political, nakedly political reasons. Yeah, but because he, he has answer? a gender gap, the answer is that it's a minus, that uh, it would I, be perceived I, I as political pandering. He would be perceived as kicking George Bush in the teeth by an awful lot of people, and I cannot think that the immediate reaction to that would be good at all. I, th I think, a great I think the, people who would be, <laughs> who would, the people who would be concerned about it we, would be outweighed in vast amounts by the, by the people who are would be will, who would be eager to vote for a woman for vice president. I think it would appear as a crass political act and it would boomerang. However, are we all agreed that Jean Kirkpatrick is indeed vice presidential material? She's Pat. a Democrat, John. Is she vice right. presidential material? So is Andrew material? Johnson. Yeah, but uh, no, for that reason, no. Richard Stone is a Democrat. He's well, he better not put Richard Stone on the tomorrow. ticket either. What does it take <laughs> to be vice presidential material? <laughs> Well, yeah, she, the answer is yes. Definitely you can. Vice is Gene material. Kirkpatrick presidential material? Mort. Uh, she is smart enough, sure. You mean her character, unfortunately, is weak? Her character is strong. I'm, her views I, you know, are John, a little the, uh, I mean, I'm, a, I, I, you know, I'm second to no one in my admiration, but the uh, first criterion of the president in this television age is the capacity to communicate over that television set. And I'm not sure that Jean Kirkpatrick has it. Well, as McNeil Lehrer is any indication, she does a magnificent job on that program. What does it take to be president or vice president? We keep proving it doesn't take much. I'd like to hear from this. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear from this gentleman. Uh, my name is David Carr, member of the Chicago <coughs> Mercantile Exchange. And in the last month, we've seen Ronald Reagan going around the country, appearing before uh, black groups, Hispanic groups, women groups trying to broaden his constituency. I, from what I read in the newspaper from Mr. Novak, uh, contrary to what he would like to see, 
this week we saw an unusual sight. We saw Ted Kennedy uh, almost attached to the hip with Jerry Falwell in Lynchburg, Virginia. Well. Uh, although, it, <laughs> although philosophically uh, they're not in accord, they didn't look too bad together uh, from what I saw. My question is, for the group, I, a general question, uh, is Ronald Reagan um, broadening his constituency too much in trying to appeal to be everything to all people, or is Jerry Falwell becoming discontented with Ronald Reagan and maybe is trying to broaden his constituency? Now, I don't think either one of those things are true. I think the thing that President Reagan is doing, I think, I mean, nobody thinks it's a terrible thing. I'm totally indifferent to whether he does it or not. I don't, but I don't think as a, as a matter of analysis that will work. You, if you lose people like blacks and Hispanics and women on policies, you don't get them back with gestures. The, the thing with Falwell and, and, and Kennedy, it, Ted Kennedy is a guy who enjoys that kind of a situation. It, it is fun for him. It, it is a... Uh, it's a it, non-serious it, event. It's a non-serious event. That's it was a true. serious speech. A very well, serious speech. I'm glad speech. you think so, John. It was a very serious speech. And what's more, it, was, it had a message in it mm -hmm. uh, to the other... To the other... I keep saying the other Democratic that's candidates. To the Democratic candidates that they ought not just go before audiences and tell them what they want to hear. Oh, you know, that's ridiculous. Oh, that's, that's, come that's, on. That's, that's a, easy, that was that a is shot. So easy shot. No, he went, he went, he went oh. into the... Oh, that was a shot. Oh, come, come on. Those, those, those Listen, I'm telling you, I happen to know from the, from the Kennedy uh, entourage oh, that... Oh, 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 just oh, 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 don't you do any reporting? You do some <laughs> that, that the idea was to, to embarrass Mondale and Glenn, who were out pandering. You know, Listen, let me, let me tell you something. That that, that, that event was one of those, those, those total non-events that the Washington media just exactly. laps up. It, uh, it was strictly a TV hype event. Now, the serious thing is, is, is whether Reagan, President Reagan, having a Hispanic week, having a, a black week, uh, pandering to the women's groups, advances his cause at all, and of course he does not. And the point of the matter is politicians sometimes forget you only need 51% of the vote to win, but you better get that 51%. I want to I want to give you my uh, answer to that playing on the other person's turf and whether it helps Ronald Reagan. Novak and I disagree 100% on this point. I believe that Ronald Reagan does help himself by going before the women's group and even letting them make fun of his quote-unquote caveman mentality towards women. I think he helps himself by going before the Hispanics. I think he helps himself by going before the blacks. Perhaps not with those immediate groups, but more to the point, he helps himself with the rank-and-file Americans who believe that Ronald Reagan, as President of the United States, is not President of the Conservatives, which is the way Novak conceives of him to be. He's President of all Americans, and they want to see him reach out whether he reaches them or not. You know, I think, I think now, I want to hear from this question over I, here. I think it's wonderful that McLaughlin who talks to neither blacks, Hispanics, nor women. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let that pass as comedy, but it was, a, it, it, was a dirty, it was a dirty pool shot, and it's not the truth. Your turn, sir. President Reagan was a Democrat. Gene Kirkpatrick is a Democrat. If you put the two of them together, you may get a lot of Democratic votes before it's over. But that, my question is, as a Democrat, why in the face of all the Republican opposition to Secretary Watt did the White House decide to keep him? I, uh, I, I am instructed occasionally by my, uh, by my friend Novak, and he had, has had a column uh, recently saying this that morning. it was uh, this morning saying that it was all, uh, it was all a result of uh, inside polling information or inside advice from a pollster to the uh, effect that uh, he would lose the right wing if he didn't do something to bolster him on, uh, himself on that uh, end. I'm sure that that advice was given, uh, but I think that the key factor involved is, is this uh, endearing quality that uh, Jack refers to. Ronald Reagan doesn't like to fire anybody. He especially doesn't like to fire anybody he agrees with, and he doesn't like to fire somebody who's been loyal to him. But so you put those two things together, the politics and the personality, and I think that's the explanation. The political advice bolstered his own inclinations, but the point of the matter is that uh, much more important to Ronald Reagan's chances for re-election are the uh, Christian evangelicals than the women or the, 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 the feminists, I should say, or the organized black groups or the organized Hispanic groups, which are going to be against him. But believe me. And they like Watt. He, sure, they love Watt. You may not love him, John, but they do. And, 
and he needs those groups not just passively voting, but working as hard for him in 84 as they did in 80. Jack. Uh, just one other point. Uh, Ronald Reagan likes Watt for a, a different reason. He likes Watt because of all the cabinet members, and, and you would know something about this. Watt is somebody who has cleaned out the bureaucracy down four or five levels and put in Pat Buchanan's kind of true believers. The other cabinet members haven't done it. He's reluctant to get rid of them for that reason. I'll go, I'll go, even, I'll go even beyond Jack Germont, because I always like to go beyond Jack Germont. Uh, Mr. Minow, I would say that the most, this is, this is heresy, but the most administratively competent member of the Reagan cabinet is Jim Watt. Pat. Um, I am afraid, I like Jim Watt, and uh, I agree with a lot of what Bob says, but I'm afraid what Jim Watt has been given is a decent interval. Oh, yeah. I don't think Jim Watt is going to be there. I don't think they're going to carry him through the general election. I think no. what the president and the staff have done is keep Jim Watt on to show their right-wing supporters, look, we're not putting him over the side, and then Watt will go before the fall election so that the Democrats can't demonize him and use him the way they're using him right now as an issue to raise money and as a real demon in the administration the way Nixon used Ramsey Clark. But if he walks out under his own power next spring, yeah. he, is, he is a whole person, while yep. if he had been dropped overboard two weeks ago, it would have been a different matter. Exactly. Yeah, I, also, I, I agree with Pat's uh, our view of this, and I also think that Ronald Reagan wants to, at all costs, avoid the impression that he is sacking Watt. So I think Watt is living on borrowed time. Uh, I would also note that there is, uh, there is some likelihood that the successor to Watt at the Department of the Interior might be William uh, Ruckelshaus. No chance. That takes care of that. <laughs> <laughs> Novak takes care of it? <laughs> or what? No chance. Next Move question. On. <laughs> they, have okay. to, they have to replace him by, with someone I roughly. I heard that a, a little deal was cut before uh, Ruckelshaus took that EPA job. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, oh. Novak. You, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Irving Robbins. My question to you is, do any of you really believe the president is honestly interested in working out the elimination of a nuclear war and is really willing to make the concessions necessary to bring about the elimination of nuclear war. Well, of course the president is interested in not having a nuclear war. Uh, any American is. But you s the premise of your question is that by making concessions to the Soviet Union at the Geneva negotiations, the other negotiations, you're going to move nuclear war or war itself further into the future. And I don't think Ronald Reagan agrees with that, and I think Ronald Reagan is right. If you, if, Reagan if, you asked me, if you asked me if he knew how to do it, I'd say no. If you asked me if he wants to do it, I'd say yes. Ronald Reagan has a theory about all this. He, one, one, he believes in deterrence, and, and he believes that you got to be str a lot stronger than we were, than we have been, in order to deter the Soviet Union from making the kind of aggressive moves that could get us into a war pe uh, uh, step at a time. Now, the, the, and, and he also has a theory about negotiation. Uh, in order to get them to make a deal, you threaten something of theirs. You don't, you don't uh, uh, show gestures of goodwill. Now, whether all of those whether he's, he's actually uh, operating wisely, I do not know. Uh, but I think his intentions are all to the good. My intuition into the man is this, that he has been bitten by the peace bug, but that he is biding his time until his second term. And during his second term, I think you will see him make astonishing breakthroughs because he's peculiarly positioned to do so. As Nixon was positioned to go into China, Whereas if Hubert Humphrey had, had been president and gone into China, he would have given the nation a, a nervous breakdown. John, so, John but, what, what will persuade the Soviets to do a deal with Ronald Reagan other than the kind of Reaganite concessions to the Soviets that leave them with superiority? If I could just, if I could just, just I can't even answer the question. I know you can't because you don't know enough to. But the, 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 <laughs> the just trashing to, the moderator again. I'm are sorry, we? I beg your pardon. <laughs> but just, just to separate. Just to give you, you a very are a piece of work, Novak. <laughs> just, to, just to give you, just to give you the very, very simple answer: to have an agreement with the Russians this year or before the election, you have to separate the INF, the Intermediate Range Missile Treaty, from the START Treaty. You have—I mean, you have to put them together. I don't mean separate it. You have to put it together. Merge the two. Merge the INF two. INF and START. That's right, and the president is unwilling to do that. He's on the way to doing that, Robert. He's on yes. the way to doing that. Believe Mark me. my words. <laughs> you, sir. Thank you. My name is Larry Horace, and I have a comment and then a quick question. Uh, the, uh, 
meeting between Kenny and Falwell, I saw some examples of the separation of religious doctrine and public policy, but he seemed to have failed, unless I missed it, to uh, mention the nuclear freeze, which there is a very close tie nationally between the churches and public policy, and you might comment on that. But a quick question and prediction. I'd like to go back to that Wednesday after the election a year from now and ask you who is going to control the United States Senate. Good question. We didn't get to that. Jack, tell us about the U.S. Senate. The, right now you're talking about a turnover of six seats. I think the, Republic, uh, the Democrats have a six if Reagan, uh, if Reagan survives. And I say right now I think Reagan's going to win. I'm not sure he's going to win. I think the Senate is essentially an even bet. I think the Democrats are ahead for three of those now, uh, ahead for at least three of those uh, prospectively, and they are in good position in five or six others. There's only one Democrat that I think of who's marginally vulnerable. Max Baucus? Pell. Pell? No, no my, Baucus. Baucus uh, in Montana. I well, before we go into, let me see, we got three certain Republican losses according to Jack. They are Texas. They're not certain. They're not, uh, no, no, I, I, those are the ones that I think are most likely Texas, Tennessee. Tennessee, Texas, Tennessee is for sure, North Carolina. Which, North Carolina. Which, which the Republicans are giving away by not yeah. mounting a decent candidate against Al Gore. And the third is Jesse. North Jesse Carolina. Helms is going yeah. down the tubes? Probably. Probably. Quite Hallelujah. probably. Hallelujah. Well, let, let, me, well. Let, me, let, me say, let me say this, that it is very, very difficult for the party that is losing the presidential election, if we were four of us mm -hmm. were correct on the presidential election, for that party to pick up a net gain in the Senate of six seats. Exactly. Has John, we're out of time. I'm going to have to interrupt. I'm sorry. You all have proved yourself masters at finishing your sentences under heavy fire. <laughs> this is a stimulating discussion. I thank you all very much, TTW and the live audience here. My thanks and good evening. <laughs>